so my name is Jason Morningstar. I'm a game designer. Uh, my company is called Bully Pulpit Games, and we're known for games uh, that don't have a game master. It's one of the things that we do. We make role tabletop role-playing games that often don't have a game master. And I'm here to sort of talk about that a little bit. But before I do, I need to poll the audience. I need to uh, find out, first of all, how many of you play role-playing games? Everybody. Okay, pretty much everybody. Not everybody, but most. How many of you have played uh, uh, GM-less role-playing games? Okay, good. That gives me a, a good uh, starting point to know where, where you're at. So uh, uh, I, I like games without a game master. I find that to be uh, quite often a very effective format. Not always, but, but often. And, the, and the, the thing that I like most about it is that it makes everybody the GM, because I love to be the game master. I love to be in charge. I love to be the guy that everyone turns to to be creative and spontaneous. And I want to share that around. That's sort of my impulse, is to share that with everyone at the table with me. That said, uh, I also design games that have a game master or that d use different models for distributing these things. And so absolutely love what you love. This is, not, uh, uh, this is not me persuading you that the, the way that I'm making these games is better, because it's not. It's just different. Uh, so if you love the traditional GM and player model, I do too. We're all on the same page. This isn't an attack on anything that you love, because we all love that. So I want to talk about some of the technical pieces of gm list design. I want to talk about some really interesting examples to give you some context. And then maybe we'll talk about some uh, some techniques that are fun to play with, even in a traditional GM and player kind of game. Uh, I have about 45 minutes, so I'll go quickly through this stuff, and then I really hope that we have time for some questions at the end. So the first thing I need to say is that GMless is a term you'll hear often, and it's really a misnomer. Uh, GMful would probably be a better term. Uh, but unfortunately, that time is, is gone. When you say GMless, it means nobody's in charge. There is literally no GM where, in fact, with many of these kinds of games, everybody's in charge. Everybody has responsibility. Uh, so GMful would be a, a better way to describe it. Unfortunately, we're, we're stuck with the terms that we have, and GMless means something to many people. Everybody who raised your hand when I said, hey, have you played a GMless game? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, regardless of, you know, the, the nomenclature. Okay, so uh, the, the, the things that, that are important when you're thinking about uh, GM-less versus GM games are credibility and authority, right? Uh, credi authority means uh, who, who is uh, allowed to make contributions, right? And credibility is... Who, who is going to accept or reject those contributions? So I can have all the authority in the world, but if, if I say, for example, hey, you know what, I'm the game master, and your character now has river blindness, and you say, no, he doesn't, that, uh, that creative contribution has been rejected, and there's nowhere for me to go, right? As the GM, I'm supposed, my word maybe is supposed to be law, but if you just say, no, that actually isn't what happens, something else happens, I reject that creative contribution, uh, then uh, you have no credibility and that's, that's not going to work. So I would argue that system, which I'm going to talk about in a second, is how these things get apportioned. Credibility and authority. So system, uh, there's actually a, a principle that we think about sometimes in tabletop role-playing game design called the Lumpley Care Principle. Some of you probably have, have heard of Vincent Baker when he came to Ropacon. Uh, he is the Lumpley in the Lumpley Care Principle. And Care is uh, Emily Care Boss, and I will be talking about one of her games later. But check out this definition. System, including but not limited to the rules, is defined as the means by which the group agrees on imagined events during play. So the uh, system includes who's buying pizza this week. It includes who had a bad day at work and just needs to kill some orcs and doesn't want to think about plot for their character. Uh, but that's all system. System is, can I persuade my uh, friend that his character has river blindness, or is he going to just reject that? Uh, the rules say that I get to give him river blindness because that's how the rules work, but the system is larger than that. And, and when I say system, that's what I'm referring to. It's pretty common to, uh, when people talk about system, they really mean rules, and rules are just a tiny piece of it in, in my sort of framework. 
uh, as, as the next slide shows. Uh, so rules, a tiny part uh, of system, right? But uh, talking about credibility and authority, uh, it's an important part, but not, not the main part, because sometimes the rules aren't actually even written down, right? And by sometimes, I mean always. When you, uh, when you play a game with your friends, there's a whole complex of uh, factors that go into how that game is played uh, that are not in the rule book. And they're different at your table than they are at my table. Maybe you have a friend and you know that uh, sometimes on game night, uh, his, he has a very stressful job and sometimes when he comes, he needs extra patience or extra attention. That's, that's part of the rules of how you play. It's part of the larger system, but it's not something that's going to appear in a rule book. So, uh, but the rules themselves, right? Uh, maybe you have a text that, that uh, tells you all about the game that you're playing, how to play Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and those rules do specific things that are actually important. Uh, they, and here's a list of them. Uh, and these are all important things, right? Uh, it's possible that your rules uh, establish divisions between players, right? Maybe your rules say, you're the game master, you're going to be the caller who says what all the characters do unless somebody objects to that. You're going to be the mapper, right? And so there, maybe there are, there are different, uh, different divisions there. Or maybe it's just you're the game master and all of the rest of us are players. Uh, a, a, a game set of rules might do that. Uh, some, uh, and that's actually an interesting point would be that like in traditional D&D, &D, uh, uh, the, the, the rules of original D&D &D say that somebody is a caller and somebody is a mapper. If you don't do that because that's not fun for your group, you've already house ruled and changed, uh, changed the system, as it were. So rules can also provide setting or color or tone. They can provide a scope of play. We're all vampires, and if you bring a werewolf to a vampire party, he is not welcome. So no, va no werewolves in our vampire game. Uh, sometimes they, uh, and almost always actually, they uh, handle adversity. Who gets to decide when there's a challenge? Who gets to decide how that challenge is resolved? I'm the game master, so I invented the orcs that are going to ambush you. I identify when that ambush takes place and I tell you how it goes or what you need to do to, uh, to avoid it. Uh, and uh, sometimes they structure and pace both the gameplay itself and the sort of emerging narrative. And, and quite, uh, quite often they don't tell you who gets to say what and when. And I'll get back to that, but that's a really important piece of system that rules almost never, never tell you. Who gets to say what and when? Uh, and again, uh, not always. These things are often left for a game master or a group to figure out. And you can look at pretty much any game and there are going to be blank spots. It would be a challenge to find a game that nailed each of these bullet points in, in its rules and told you how to do all this stuff. I'm sure they're out there. Uh, but I can't, I, I can't think of any offhand. So, so a game master, right, uh, takes those things that the, the rules do and that the larger system does and uh, it, it sort of uh, takes control of those, right? It's a, uh, the Game Master is a collection of these responsibilities. Um, can be atomized in different ways, um, and what a, much of what a GM does is unwritten and unspoken, which I think is really interesting. Our uh, typically uh, tabletop role playing's culture of play is transmitted informally from person to person. So it's unusual, at least in the States, and I'd be interested to know if it's different in Finland, for someone to go and buy a copy of Dungeons and Dragons having never played and teach his or her friends how to play, and they've never played either. So, so uh, learning how to play the game strictly from uh, the book without any outside influence. Uh, mostly games are transmitted uh, in uh, social ways. In other words, somebody who played at Ropicon comes home and is like, hey guys, I did this cool thing, let's buy a book and see if we can do it too. But they have some knowledge, they've seen how a game master and players behave, for example. Uh, and the, the assumed stuff that, that doesn't uh, end up in, uh, in the actual rules, the unwritten and unspoken stuff, can also be pretty odd sometimes. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to play uh, with someone who's never played a role-playing game before because they often assume the stance of an author, uh, which, is, uh, which is normally not, not allowed. So, uh, for example, as the game master, I might say, uh, you enter a tavern and there is a, you know, an old man in the corner looking over a map. And, and uh, 
uh, uh, someone who's played a lot of role-playing games would be like, oh, cool, well, that guy's probably got a map that leads to treasure. Maybe we should go talk to him. And what a, a new player will often do is say, oh, wow, that's great. That guy has a map that has the deed to his family farm on it, and his neighbor is trying to steal it from him. And uh, his name is uh, Jorgen, and we're going to go talk to him and help him. And, and, and what I see time and time again is, is people will be like, no, 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 you don't get to say that. Shh, shh, let's stop that. Uh, that's not for you to decide. That's for me to decide because I'm the game master. Uh, and and once they, you know, they're put down one or two times, they realize, oh, okay, I need to wait for that information to come to me. I don't get to create that. Uh, and I would argue that that's not fun. I, when when that happens in games that I'm running with new people, I'm like, bring it. Let's let's hear let's hear more about this Jorgen character. That sounds great. Uh, here are my notes. I'm gonna throw them away. <laughs> Uh, and we all have more fun, maybe. Okay, so, so the GM does some specific things, and, it, and if you're going to make a game that doesn't have the, that person, does, that stuff still needs to get done. And uh, it's really interesting to think about ways that that's going to get done. And I'll, I'll mention a few things that are very common in GM-less games. If, uh, if you've played them, you've, you probably see some of this. Uh, let's go back a couple slides because I want to talk about the things that the rules do. Uh, so uh, in a lot of GM-less games, uh, the uh, structure and pace of play is procedural, uh, w w by which I mean I get a turn, then you get a turn, then you get a turn, then you get a turn, and then the game is done uh, in, the, in the broadest sense. Um, they're uh, usually, not always, but quite often, very egalitarian about divisions between player roles. So in a GM-less game, typically everybody has the same amount of power and the same amount of authority, the same amount of credibility, hopefully, although credibility is really a social construct. The idea being that when it's my turn in a GM-less game, I'm, I might take on different roles, I might have more authority and maybe more credibility, but when that turns and now it's your turn, those, those duties fall to you. Uh, so there's some there, there there's not differences between what players actually do during the game. Uh, the, the creation, identification, and adjudication of adversity, which is a huge part of any role-playing game, uh, in a GMless game, the system has to help with that, uh, and uh, usually it does. Some of this other stuff, though, providing scope, color, and tone, or telling you who gets to say what when, sometimes it's better if they don't do that. And uh, we'll, I'll give you some examples of that as well. But, but uh, those are things that are uh, they're common across all role-playing games, and uh, GM-less games have the same challenges with those, I would suggest, that games with a GM do. So let's look at some games. Okay, Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, ostensibly not a GM-less game, although you can play it that way if you want. Uh, so who creates, identifies, and adjudicates adversity in Dungeons & Dragons? The Game Master does. Absolutely. Uh, it's set up in, with a sharp dichotomy between two, two roles, the Game Master and the players. And the players do not uh, decide what kind of trouble happens. They can, they can help, uh, but, but it's not their job to populate the dungeon. Uh, it's the Game Master's job to do that. It's not their job to decide when the monsters hear them uh, arguing in the hallway. It's not their job to decide what happens when the monsters attack them. Uh, that's, that's done either w with the GM in a referee role or through some kind of randomness. And I'm not going to go through all these points. I just wanted to, to illustrate that D&D is a, is a traditional, the most traditional game, and it's... Uh, 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 it's, uh, it's a good uh, example of the opposite kind of, of, of a GM-less game. Although, as I said, you can play it without a GM, and it's pretty fun when you do. Okay, here's a game I know that's pretty good. <laughs> I like this one. Uh, and uh, it builds on other, many other games. There's lots of other games that influenced Fiasco. Uh, it actually does almost nothing unique. And I'm not ashamed to say that. So in Fiasco, this is, this is a, a good point. Uh, who gets to say what and when in Fiasco? If you look in the book, it will never tell you. And that was a conscious decision. Because I think that in a game like this, the best person to decide who gets to say what and when around the table is you and your friends. You guys have a, a system. You have a social contract, probably. You know how, to, how that you interact with each other well. And uh, there's no reason for me to step in and tell you who gets to say what and when. Now, that the, the opposite is, is definitely also true, that the, the, uh, 
the structure of play is very rigid, so that in Fiasco we have turns and we take turns uh, sort of in sequence. Everybody uh, essentially is going to get four chances to be in the spotlight over the course of the game. And when it's your, your opportunity to be in the spotlight, uh, you have, the, you have a, a few more decisions to make, but, but it's pretty much uh, the same uh, amount of authority and hopefully credibility as the other players. Uh, so so that is, that's pretty rigid uh, in terms of organization. It's the game's going to last about the same amount of time, it's going to move in the same progression, and it's going to follow the same narrative arc every time. Uh, but in terms of uh, deciding uh, who gets to say what and when, that doesn't really tell you that. I guess when a little bit, but certainly uh, it doesn't tell you how to role play a scene, and some games do. Here's another game uh, that uh, I wrote and that we published a few years ago, Carolina Death Crawl. I recommend it. It's pretty good. Uh, and uh, in this, this is a, another GM-less game. This is a competitive game. So I was really interested in the idea of uh, uh, taking, taking that GM-less formula and making it explicitly competitive, which I had done before, uh, but uh, not in, in, in exactly this way. So in this game, uh, it's paced by, by uh, uh, cards and card play, uh, which is just another way to, to make, make a choice about how that's going to be handled, because it has to be handled. It has to be addressed. Uh, there's some other games that I'm going to uh, uh, mention here in a moment that do that in, uh, in different ways uh, or in, in more open ways. But in Carolina Death Crawl, uh, the, uh, the, the, the game is structured in three acts. At the end of every act, one of the characters dies, and at the end of the game, there's only one survivor. So it's explicitly competitive. You're trying to be the, the character who survives. Um, and uh, that also helps define the, the scope of play, right? Because there's no time or energy for anything other than survival. You, you have a specific goal, and everything that happens is going to feed into that goal. Hey, zombie cinema. Uh, oh, <laughs> hands up, zombie cinema. Has anybody played? Oh, come on, you guys. This is your, this is your hometown team. Uh, this was uh, Aero Tuovenen, uh, and uh, it's a great game. Uh, and I'm not sure why you haven't all played this 100 times, because it's a really good game. Uh, so in Zombie, Zombie Cinema, is a, it's, a role, it's explicitly a role-playing game, but it takes a lot of influence from board games. Uh, it actually has a board, and uh, your characters will move forward and backward on that board, and the, the, two, uh, the two ends of the, the board in Zombie Cinema are you escape the zombie infestation, and you're fine, and it's over for you. The zombies have got you. And you're constantly moving back and forth within that uh, sort of space of possibility, and the really fun thing about it is that uh, there are circumstances that allow you to move farther away from certain doom at the expense of other characters. So you push them closer toward their doom uh, in order to help your character uh, survive longer, which, uh, you know, perfectly, I think, it models and is evocative of uh, zombie stories, right? Sometimes you have to push somebody under the bus to get away. Uh, and uh, the fact that it has this board that it's, uh, that it's uh, using uh, as a metaphor for that core conceit of the zombie story means that the boundaries of play are crystal clear. Uh, you know the scope of zombie cinema the, the minute you look at it. Uh, you know exactly what's going to happen. You know kind of how the story is going to be told and, and ultimately what the outcome is going to be. There's lots of uncertainty about who is going to survive, but you know it's not going to be everybody. Uh, because that's just not how it works. Uh, it's completely GM-less. Yeah, you just sit down with your friends to play. And uh, the, the other pieces of this question here, right? Setting color and tone, you come in knowing exactly what you're, what you're going to experience. It's going to be a story of desperate survival against flesh-eating monsters. Um, and uh, in terms of adversity, uh, it's, you, you make choices when it's your turn. Again, it's a turn-taking game. Uh, and uh, the choices you make uh, involve some, potentially involve some randomness, but the, the real choice you're making is whether you're going to uh, betray the people that you trust or that trust you or whether you're going to work together with them. And those are both viable options in zombie cinema. Zombie Cinema is another game that doesn't tell you how to role play. It doesn't tell you who gets to say what. It doesn't tell you uh, when they get to say things. Uh, I recommend it. It's a great game. 
So Archipelago uh, is a game that was written by a Norwegian guy named um, uh, Matthias Holter. Uh, this is my favorite role-playing game. If you guys want a recommendation for a cool game to check out, uh, Archipelago is the one I would recommend. It's free. You can find it online. If you look for it, look for Archipelago 3. He's uh, made multiple versions, and of course, the internet is forever, so Archipelago 1 and Archipelago 2 are out there, and they're fine, but Archipelago 3 is exceptionally nice because I laid it out. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, 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 the really interesting thing for me about Archipelago in terms of GM-less design and play is that where most of these games that I'm mentioning really do structure play, there's turn taking, there's a specific end point. Uh, you're, uh, you're working towards some goal and then that goal is wrapped up. In Fiasco, you have a big problem and everything blows up in your face and then you find out that the people who were the worst end up doing great and the people who were really nice end up getting screwed. That's that's the fiasco game, that's what happens. In Carolina Death Crawl, one person's gonna survive and you know it going into the game. Uh, in zombie cinema, some will live and some will die, but in the end, the zombies will take over. Uh, Archipelago isn't like that. It's structured much more like a traditional role-playing game. Uh, you create a setting yourself, so you establish your own uh, setting, color, and tone. And that, uh, it's, it's modeled on, uh, sort of inspired by Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea books, if you're familiar with those. So it's really about journeys. The idea is that you're traveling from place to place. The characters don't necessarily even uh, have to be together. They just have to sort of be moving between locations. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful game that works really well. The way that it structures things since it's not going scene by scene with turn taking like you, you would have in a, a tr traditional uh, GM-less game. Uh, everybody owns things in Archipelago. When you start the game, you decide what the most important things in your setting are, and then you, uh, e every session you play, somebody owns those things, and they become the authority and expert on that. So we played a game where we were, uh, we were workers in a, a circus carnival traveling through America in the 1940s. Uh, and we thought about that and we thought, what are the most important things to these people? Well, one of them is money, right? Because they're always broke and they're always desperate. One of them is people in the towns that they're passing through, outsiders to the, to the carnival. Uh, I don't, do you remember any of the other uh, things that we owned in that game, Steve? Family, yeah, that's right. Because, uh, you know, we were a family of carnival workers that had to work together, but there were families as well of, you know, actual people with children. Um, so, so every session, somebody would get those things, right? So somebody was responsible for family. Somebody was responsible for money. And whenever a question about that came up, they decided. They were the boss. Uh, and it's a beautiful way to, to distribute that sort of authority and credibility. Uh, and uh, it's really fun because it also reinforces what your game's about every session. Every time you play, you're getting one of these things to own that you've all agreed on is the important thing I in your game. And so those things always come back because they're always on your mind. And if you're in charge of money, well, you're going to make sure that money is going to be a problem for your character. And if you're in charge of family, you're going to give us some family drama right? Because that's fun. Uh, and the game helps you do that. Uh, it's a very clever game and it's really fun. Uh, and I wish that I could play it with all of you. I'm actually running a session of it, uh, I think tomorrow on Sunday. Uh, and you're welcome to come and watch. I don't know. There's only three or four seats uh, to play, but uh, it's a cool game and you should check it out. Uh, I think I've evangelized for Archipelago enough. We'll move on. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned Emily Kerr-Boss, who's a very talented uh, American game designer. Uh, she wrote a game called Breaking the Ice, which is a two-player game. Uh, in, in Breaking the Ice, you're telling the story of two characters who are going on three dates. So it's a romance game. It's about whether these people find a connection and become lovers or whether they go their separate ways. And after three dates, you know what's going to happen with these people. One of the interesting things about, our, uh, about Breaking the Ice, uh, to me, is the, the establishment of setting color and tone in this game uh, re revolves around players uh, uh, going outside their own comfort zones. So when you create a character in this game, it has to be someone who is opposite from you in some way. They have to be of an opposite gender, for example, or they have to have an opposite worldview or an opposite race, uh, whatever works for you, but you can't play somebody who's anything like yourself. 
And what that ends up doing is providing some real empathy in the situation uh, for, for your character and uh, perhaps more broadly and, more, and socially uh, for people who are not like you, uh, which makes the game challenging uh, and thought-provoking and really fun. Uh, I enjoy it every time I play, and it's, it's, it, that's, a, that's a, an interesting feature of the game that isn't necessarily related to, to GM-less play, but is, it makes it a very strong game. Uh, that game is paced uh, by having three dates. After your third date, the game's over. You know that it's, it's, uh, it's a short game that you're going to play in one session. Uh, Breaking the Ice doesn't really tell you who gets to say what when. Uh, the scope and boundaries of play are very clear, uh, and there's not really much adversity in it. Um, there is a, a sort of die mechanic that it uses uh, related to whether these people are having a successful time or not. Um, but it's not really adversarial. It's more cooperative. Microscope. Uh, is anybody familiar with Ben Robbins' game Microscope? A couple of hands. It's a really nice game. It's really interesting. Uh, um, and it, uh, it's interesting from a GM-less point of view uh, related to the way that it handles uh, that, that judgment piece, that referee piece. Uh, so in Microscope, you're not really telling the stories of individuals. It's not about uh, making characters. You, in fact, you don't really make characters in Microscope. You're telling the story of a, a larger group, a society, uh, um, uh, an organization, a civilization, um, an empire. And uh, the, uh, the things that are going to uh, impact uh, success or failure for that, uh, for that uh, group uh, revolve around uh, what, what in Microscope is called tone. And tone is either light or dark, and it refers sort of to positive or, or negative outcomes for this group. Let's, you know, if it's a galactic empire, you're going to be creating events. Uh, sort of along a timeline that grows uh, over time. Uh, and then within the events, there can be other things that happen, but, but the tone uh, is, is the sort of the mechanical piece that's going to influence how things go. And maybe you know, uh, at the beginning of the game, you might just have two cards, uh, one that says Galactic Empire formed, and the other one that says Galactic Empire falls into ruin. And in between that, all kinds of interesting things are going to happen, uh, and those are uh, dictated by tone. Microscope is also interesting uh, because uh, it actually does, it's one of the few games uh, that I've talked about here that really does tell you who gets to say what and when. There's a concept called the hot seat in Microscope. And when you're in the hot seat, you get to say stuff and everybody else has to shut up, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little nerve wracking, but, uh, but also a really nice way to apportion that particular authority. Uh, when someone's in the hot seat, you pay attention to them and give them uh, respect as a creator uh, without any uh, ability to uh, refute or to deny. They have complete credibility because the game uh, says so. Uh, they have complete authority. Whether you give the credibility to their input or not is another matter, uh, but they have 100% authority. I shouldn't confuse those two terms. Okay, so I want to talk very briefly, and then I'm going to open this up to questions, and I hope we can have a, a short discussion. Uh, maybe you want to experiment with, with GM-less games. Maybe you want to design one. Maybe you want to add some of these interesting elements to your traditional uh, game that has a game master and players. Uh, so my first question about whether making a GM to game GM-less is do you really want to do that? If you're having fun with what you've got, stick with it. I mean, people don't design games to, to be broken, so if the game master is there, he, prob he or she probably needs to be. Uh, it's, it's serving a useful purpose. And I design games that have game master as well, it's not a it's not a problem. Uh, but let's say that you want to introduce some of these things that work very well when you don't have a GM, and introduce them in, in other ways. So here's three techniques. One of them is fishing. You probably do this anyway. Uh, in fact, you probably do all of these in 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 uh, in your home games. And I'm just giving names to them, I guess. So. Uh, Let's say, so this is fishing, right? You're turning questions over to your players. Uh, you ask me, uh, I don't know, is, is, uh, is this guy telling me the truth? And I said, I don't know, is he telling you the truth? Uh, traditionally, as the game master, I get to decide whether he's telling you the truth or not, but I'm asking you to tell me and to surprise me and to let me know, uh, you know, what's going on. Or uh, they might say, is there, a, is there a blacksmith in this town? And I'll be like, I don't know. Is there a blacksmith in this town? You tell me. 
Uh, so that's phishing. Uh, or, or another, another way to do that would be to, to say, this is sort of the, the classic example. Uh, there's a guy coming, uh, or there's a demon coming down the path and he's holding a severed human head. Whose head is it? Right? Uh, so as the GM, I'm giving you license to tell me that it's somebody important to you or interesting in some way. And your answer is going to inform further play, right? If you say, oh, that's the head of uh, the, the, the man who trained me. Well, that's cool. That, that tells me a lot, and I can work with that. Uh, a lot of games have some kind of narrative currency in them already. Uh, so if you play fate, you get fate points for putting your character into situations that are not optimal. It's a way of encouraging uh, more dramatic play that might lead more toward failure. Uh, if you play Savage Worlds, you get bennies, which essentially do the same thing. It gives you bonuses. Uh, it allows you to have uh, some impact on the developing story that would traditionally be in the GM's hands. Even if it's as simple as saying, actually, I succeed because I've got a benny to spend. Uh, you thought I failed, but I didn't. And the third idea uh, is, is uh, giving players more agency over bigger aspects of the game. So this can vary from anything from blue booking, which means uh, asking people to write fiction uh, about their, player, their characters between sessions. So write a couple pages uh, about what your character does during this downtime. Uh, give me some interesting things to work with, and I'll give you 100 experience points. Uh, so that's one, you know, one aspect of, of agency, a very minor one. But as the GM, you could then look at that if you wanted to read it and, and uh, you know, pull things out that you could use to make the game more interesting. Uh, but you could also say, hey, do me a favor and design that continent. Right? Uh, we're going to be playing in that, you know, we're going to take a, a, a sea voyage to this continent. I want you to design it. Uh, and maybe when we get there, I want you to be the game master and we'll switch roles. Right? So uh, you, can, you can certainly uh, give players more agency over lots of things, uh, whether it's uh, it, you know, fiction within the game world or uh, uh, you know, more information on the backstory of their characters. So there's just some, uh, some things that you, you quite often see in GMless games that are easy to, easy to, to use to implement. OK, so that's my slides. It's, uh, Okay, so we have uh, about fi 10 to 15 minutes. Let's call it 10 minutes, and I would love to have a conversation with you guys. Uh, first of all, are there, are there questions? Can we start with uh, questions you might have about GMless games in general, uh, techniques in particular, things I said you don't agree with? Here's one in the back. I'm going to throw you a microphone, okay? This, this might take a couple, th a couple of hops back. So I'm going to try to get it to you, and then you can pass it along. Awesome. Okay, does this work? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, what's the longest story, like in in game sessions or whatever, that that you've been playing GMless? Uh, it would be Archipelago, and uh, we typically like ten sessions, maybe. Yeah. Uh, typically, uh, GMless games are going to run for shorter shorter periods of time. I think it would be difficult or m more challenging to run like an endless campaign with any of these. Archipelago would be the closest. Uh, many of these games I suggested or mentioned are all, you're going to play them in four hours or one evening. Can you do it? Can you get it to them? Sure. Almost. Almost. Uh, do you have any practical advice on how to work with the, the kind of social dynamics such as the most creative person or the loudest person kind of, I'm not saying monopolizing the plot, plot but bringing some certain elements to the game time and time again. And have you noticed any, I, I don't really play GMless games, uh, have you noticed any kind of a, uh, reoccurring patterns that happen in GMless games because of the fact that many creative interests got kind of mixed up in one game. Yes, that's a great question, and uh, it, I, I have, uh, and it's true. One of the things that quite often happens is that your first session will be absolutely crazy, because once people realize that there really is no one whose job it is to hold them back or to restrain them, that they'll just go bananas. And uh, uh, it's, uh, that kind of play is fun once in a while, and really it's great to sort of get it out of your system, uh, but it's, it, it, over time it, it gets it's toned down. Uh, so, so that's something to maybe plan for. If, you, if you're thinking about playing a bunch of GMless games, start with Fiasco. Play a session of Fiasco where everybody's got a monkey on the moon and uh, let, it, let them get it out of their system and be silly and crazy and uh, you know, set penguins on fire and then, then move on to, uh, to an, another game that maybe is a little bit uh, less 
gonzo. Or, or, you know, or then play another session of Fiasco and say, that was fun. Now let's try it focusing on making a game that's melancholy or that is, uh, you know, that, that is, uh, has a different tone to it. Let's play it as though it were a Tarantino movie or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so is that, that, is a, that is a definite pattern that you'll see uh, with GM-less games in spe specifically. Now, uh, your other piece of your question was about social dynamics. And I don't have a lot to say about that because that really is dependent on the social contract that you and your friends develop. If you have a player, uh, your friend, uh, who is constantly uh, interrupting other players or that is uh, uh, not, not giving credibility that's been earned to other players, to denying their creative input. That's something that you need to, to solve on a social level. And I, I feel like I can do that with my home group, but I'm, I don't think I could give you advice for how to do it with yours. Since I have this piece that gives me agency on the hot seat, I'm going to go on with my question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one, one small addition. I mean, of course, there are these, these kind of everyday social dynamic problems, right. like, like one guy holding onto the hot seat and not giving it away and stealing Perfect the show. Perfect example. And, and challenging the person who is in charge yes. and whatever. Yes. But, but, awesome but of example. course, there are also these kind of the highest escalation steals the plot. Like we are playing a royal family and whatever, and we are having the nice little drama here, and then, then he decides to declare war. And the next 10 sessions are about the war, for instance. Oh, OK. So, so, so this, this happens, I think, in, a, in, in good groups also, where it's not all about like someone hoarding the, the thing and, and stealing the spotlight and that kind of stuff. Uh, well, okay, yeah, uh, that, that can happen, and uh, my advice then is to play better, right? Uh, so <laughs> so uh, l listen, listen to your, the, your fellow players, right? Uh, if, if it's clear that you have two people that you trust and love that are really angling toward a diplomatic game, then don't declare war, because that's not what your game's about. And maybe when you're done playing the diplomatic game, say, guys, I really want a blood and thunder war game. Next time, let's do that. Uh, so again, that's, a, that's an issue that I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have a good answer for, other than trusting and loving the people you're with, listening more than you talk. Uh, which is my mantra, and uh, just uh, you know, trying to, to, to care about everyone at the table. All right, here's a, here's a question. Okay, deceivingly simple question. Why, why to do GM full games? That's a great question. It, it, is, uh, it is simple, and the answer is because that's the right solution for that game. Uh, every game is different, and I don't approach uh, any game design with the, the idea that it's going to be a GM-less game. I approach them with the idea that I need to figure out the best way to distribute authority uh, so that pe everybody has the most fun. And it just so happens that, for me, that is often, uh, the, the, the solution to that is often GM-less, but not always. All right. Yeah, it works. Anyway, you mentioned uh, these GM-less games having like enforced mechanical structures mm -hmm. typically, but when would you and have you had experience of um, throwing away that structure in favor of a better game? For example, That's someone true. suggests, let's do this instead of relying on the rules this time. Mm -hmm. Where's the limit? What, what would you consider to be the, the limit? That's a good question. Uh, I think uh, just just like uh, my answer to the previous question, which is that you you know you start with making the best choice for the game you're designing. You need to make the best choice for the game you're playing. And if uh, that choice is a different set of rules, then then that's the the thing to do, right? Um, I don't know that I understand your question completely, unless that answers it. Um, well, yeah, it's a very case by case basis. But what I'm basically asking is if the players come to a consensus that it would actually be more interesting if we didn't follow the rules this time. Mm. Oh, okay, I can, I can talk about that. They're wrong. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but I, I really, I, 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 uh, I firmly believe that uh, system matters, that you should play games as written as best you can. And if you reach the decision, if you come to a point where you say, we, it would be better not to play with these rules than to play with the rules, then you should, uh, 
then you should reassess what you're doing, right? Maybe you should be playing a different game, uh, or maybe you should be doing a different activity, right? If the rules are not supporting you, then the rules have failed, and that's, that's a discussion to have with your friends about what to do. Uh, I, 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 yeah, the, the idea that uh, you would uh, that you would say, well, this time just let's just hand wave this. I, I typically I would not I would not advocate that. Although people do it all the time, and I've done it myself. I have sort of I have sort of a continu continuation to that. Uh, instead of just ignoring that rule that time, I think it would be that that's an indication that you would rather play with a house rule. It's a good idea to think of a generality that you can apply and then write that as a rule and then continue to play with those rules instead of skipping one rule because that deteriorates the sure. influence of the rules and it ultimately detracts from the game. I think, but if you make another rule that that overrides that place, then I think that's a better option. Okay, there's someone right behind you who had a question, and then we're going to throw it over here to you guys on this side. Okay, this is a challenging position. Uh, I would like to ask you about the dynamics of uh, GM authority, because we have been discussing games that have one person with the whole GM package, mm -hmm. and we have been discussing games that apportion it equally between all the players. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, are there, is there any middle ground about games that have a few GMs, but not everybody in the same position of authority, that split their authority between some people in GM roles and some people in uh, player roles? Absolutely. Yeah, there, there are. And that's, I think, an, a, an emerging and very interesting uh, place in, in the design spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, I know of games where uh, the roles are inverted, where there are four GMs and one player, for example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a game called Dirty Secrets that, that does that very well. Uh, uh, games with two GMs. Games with two GMs. I know they're out there. I'm drawing a blank. Oh, yeah. Well, there's uh, Nathan Pauletta's game, Worldwide Wrestling, which is awesome and adorable. Uh, uh, there, is a, there, is a, uh, there is a GM, a game master, but there's also an announcer who tells you what's happening in the fight. Uh, and uh, they have two separate but important roles. Uh, and that, that would be a great example, actually, I think. All right, toss it way over. Who wants it? Okay, that's the need. Thank you. And we uh, have time for maybe two more questions. Yeah, I'll be concise. Uh, question is, um, I have a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons players. How can I um, how can I push them towards this GM-less uh, <laughs> thing? How, how can I explain them that this is nice thing? Uh, how to pull them in? Uh, right. Okay. So the first answer to that is don't do that. Those guys like what they're doing. They're happy. There's no need to uh, to try to change their minds. Uh, but if they're open to that and they're interested, then then the thing to do is to take a, a game like Fiasco and say, Hey guys, two hours of your time. We're gonna do this one night. I will provide the beer. Uh, and when it's done, it's done. There's no commitment here. Uh, and then just give it, a, give it a try. And the people who show up are the ones who might be interested in starting a new group. And the people who don't show up are very happy with Dungeons and & Dragons and leave them alone, right? <laughs> That's great. Let, let them do what they love and, and continue to play with them. Okay, one more question. Uh, how about the switching times? Do you think it's, uh, is there, I'm guessing that sort of minimum time might be one sentence between switching authority and probably one evening is the longest one if you want to switch around, but uh, what, are, what are other times might there be? One scene? What time lengths between switching the authority? Oh, uh, it's, yeah, it, it's going to vary. So, some games are very specific about how long, uh, how, how long a portion of uh, fictional content is, and some are wide open. Uh, Fiasco, for example, sorry to keep going back to it, but it's a great game. Uh, <laughs> There's, uh, when you have a scene, uh, that scene uh, can be a, a discrete unit of time. Often it's, I'm shooting the prostitute in the knee. But sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's a long period of time and you're like, okay, four months have passed and now I'm recovering from my knee injury. Right? So it, it, can, uh, it, it can vary and there, there's nothing in the game that tells you uh, what that, how, how to structure that. Um, I don't know, uh, and a microscope is, is another good example of that where uh, you might be describing a, an eon, a thousand years, a hundred thousand years of time between scenes or during a scene, uh, or it might be the minute that the emperor is assassinated. So uh, 
I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure that it does. But. Actually, I was going more for the, like that in uh, or out of game time. Is it between one sentence or one evening of play? Or oh, uh, what? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I I don't understand. Just um, what were? Do you think like um, is there an optimal time of switching or? Is it just switching between what and what? Uh, between the GM authority, between people, oh, or players. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, probably a session is a good unit of time if you're if you're going to to make those kinds of changes because it gives you time to be comfortable with it and then you you make an adjustment. I would say, I think that's probably if I understand, which I don't. <laughs> that's, I think we're, we're, that's all the time we have, right? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm happy to talk about this more. I want to meet you guys this weekend. Please come and, uh, and talk to me some more. Thanks very much.